are watching Property TV. Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the show where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. Joining me today is Hayley Andrews of Your Freedom Empire. Hello Hayley. Hello. Good journey down. It was okay. So-so. Yeah. So-so. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go into detail. No, it's better okay. we don't. <laughs> okay, just glad you're here anyway. Good to Thank see you. you. Okay, and Nicholas Zapoides, who is uh, founder of Nicholas Chartered Surveyors. Welcome to you. Good to Thank have you. you back again. I think your second time now, mm -hmm. so it should be a bit easier for you this time. Awesome. Okay, Nicholas, you're going to go first. So, I'm hoping to buy a new house on a small housing estate in the home counties. Although there is a river running close to the town, it's not very close to the development. However, I am worried after seeing the devastation flooding can cause, even in what have appeared to be safe areas. Um, Will any danger of flooding show up in any reports created by my solicitor? I, pres I presume he's thinking there's a report on title there or something, but um, during the purchase process, or should I make my own inquiries? And if so, who with? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so your solicitor will carry out searches for the property to see if it is in a, in a flood zone risk. Uh, and that comes up as high, medium, low, or very low. Um, and if it is high, your lender might require you to get insurance against it. So you could do that to safeguard your own risk. Um, you can carry out independent surveys, albeit there isn't a a uh, flood certificate for, for these kind of surveys, but you can uh, instruct a chartered surveyor. Is that a clever that. way of saying there's nothing you can rely on? <laughs> Um, no, it's more saying that unlike, say, valuation, you have an accredited valuer um, who is certified for that particular role. Um, with flood surveys, it's not quite the same. Okay. So what I'm saying is you can look to the RSES to appoint a um, experienced chartered surveyor who has experience in these matters. Yeah, I, su I suppose perhaps the, the saving grace is that the developer themselves will have had to go through that process with, when they, for the planning consent. I seem to planning remember consent, some- Planning consent, yeah, yeah, lending so, requirements. Yeah. So they would have you know, done their own due diligence. But again, you can look to get your own independent survey. It is something that is getting worse, um, mainly due to climate change, global warming, infrastructure as well. So I seem to remember some years ago I did a development on the Thames and um, you, you then you, you applied to the Environment Agency and they gave you, I, I think it was um, sort of one in 100 year chances. Of, yeah, so of, that, that's of, of what, what the searches the, um, are when your, your solicitor mm -hmm. carries out them searches. That would also include contamination as well um, under that and other matters. And, so. and, and the dreaded uh, Japanese knotweed, of course. And, yeah, and that <laughs> Again, as well. Again, a really big issue. It's, it is. Yeah. yeah. It's the, the, Have you ever come across that in any of your developments? No, I haven't. I, I, Although one of the areas I invest in uh, where I'm buying residential property and letting them out as buy-to-lets or HMOs, um, it has got quite a lot of Japanese knotweed because it's around the rail. Uh, so mm. they used to... It was a Victorian plant, wasn't it? Yes. So they brought it over from... Jap was it Japan? Well, I think I it was. I, I, yeah. I think they brought it over from yeah. Japan to kind of knit the banks of the railways together. You're right, it did knit the banks knit together. Everything yeah. together. Kept it nice and neat. Looks lovely, but it's very, very destructive and it's becoming a mm. really big issue. I think really, really getting rid issue. of it is the issue. I mean, you have to excavate it and then it has to go to a special yeah. decontamination area. It's where, ongoing as well. Yeah, so yeah. The, 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 you know, the treatment plan has to be ongoing. I think the good thing about it is because it's becoming more and more common and obviously, you know, lenders are now, it used to be where you couldn't get a mortgage if it had Japanese knotweed. Now, if there's kind of a, a plan in place, a treatment plan, yeah. plan in place, that they will, you've got more lenders that will look at that now. 
now yeah. and see it as manageable and, and not as risky. But it, it is a big issue along with flooding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Quite on a, it, when you mentioned about it, well, it's getting worse. It, it's quite interesting. I, I remember having a conversation with the Environment Agency and, of course, you, you, you tend to ask, well, why don't these floodplains still work? And, of course, the old system was that rain would just come off your gutters, it would fall into the fields, the fields would actually absorb a certain amount. So by the time it actually got to the rivers, it was quite quite well reduced. Yeah. But now, with the excellent draining systems that we've got, they're so fast that within a minute from falling from your roof, it's actually in the river. Yeah. And, of course, that's caused the, the, the sudden upsurge of flooding. I think a lot of people have, well, have, uh, have obviously built out as, and so they've got less you've got less grassland and things like that to kind of absorb yeah. so most people will do mm -hmm. their driveways and things yeah. like that so it's yeah. I think it's just getting worse and worse and worse isn't well it? I know and I, I mean I actually used to live on, on, on virtually on the Thames and um, we, we had an area that we wanted to sort of box in downstairs and what they made us do was was dig a great big sort of incursion into the land to let mm -hmm. so we had to compensate flood area for yeah. for built area yeah but many people don't That's ask right. permission they'll just go away and you know block pave their drive or and and don't realize that perhaps they do have to ask for that permission and they just yeah. get on with it and of course what a complex world we live in yeah okay Haley, your question thank you sorry thank you for that mate. Anyway. <laughs> um Hayley, uh taking a six bedroom home and converting it into an hmo would the panel think it would add to the property's value overall or would it decrease decrease its potential sales value in addition would its sales potential be diminished if one attempted to sell it as a going concern or would it be better to revert it back to a single dwelling if i decided to opt out of the project at a later date Oh, great mm. question. There's mm. a few different questions in there as well. Isn't there? Let me try and think about that in order. You want something else? <laughs> no, yeah. Well, actually, Nicholas should probably answer that question as, uh, as he... Well, well I, I, I just, I, like, I just yeah. want to see if he agrees with you. Yeah, well, that's fine. I, I'm sure he will. And so um, there's a few different ways that... Yeah, I mean, in terms of the last part of that question, let's handle that first. Um, would the property be worth more as, a, you know, a house sold as a family a home business, or a I HMO think, yeah. um, sold as an ongoing concern would really come down to the asset quality, the area, the demand for HMOs, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no, um, you know, there's no one answer for that. It, it depends. And without having the postcode of the person that sent the, can't, I wouldn't can't tell know. You <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know. But there are a few different ways that you can uh, value a HMO. Um, so, of course, your smaller HMOs, um, so your three to kind of six, um, you are more likely to get a bricks and mortar comparable. Um, so I always work out my smaller HMOs from a valuation point of view based off, you know, sold comparables within mm. that area, like for like, similar size, size, etc. cetera. Um, that being said, if you are, so four and six, sorry, three, three to four, will always be bricks and mortar, in my opinion. From my experience over the last 20 years and 15 doing HMOs, that, that's been very much the model. Is that because of the lesser licensing requirements? And well, like that? Um, it's because they don't require a mandatory license, mm. even if they do require additional or, or, or selective. Um, and of course, um, if you're outside of an Article 4 area under permitted development, you can switch from C3 to C4. So um, I suppose you can turn it back into a house. So if it looks like a house, it feels like a house, it's going to be valued as a house. Mm. But when you're looking at, and very much now the model and definitely the last five years you know when you're looking at your five and your six person HMOs and you're doing en suites in every single room you know you you're making modifications and changes to the property converting it into a HMO you are more likely then to get a commercial valuation and that will be based off a local yield a local mm. commercial yield but I'm going to caveat that you're not guaranteed it. It's a very grey area. It depends on your broker. It depends on your valuer. It depends on the lender. Um, so I would say always work your figures out on bricks and mortar. Um, you may get a hybrid between the two, so a comparable and the fact that it is an income producing asset, um, or you may get a commercial um, uh, valuation uh, based off the local yield. As soon as you go to seven, or more, it's a commercial valuation basically. Um, so you will get your commercial valuation there. Um, so the grey area, of course, is the five and six beds, I would say. Mm. And it, it's very much 
always depends. So I always minimise my risk as much as possible by um, doing my figures based off the bricks and mortar comparable. If I end up getting a commercial based off the income it produces and I get you know a much higher value as a result, awesome. that's a Brilliant. bonus. So simply we're back to comparables, aren't we? Then? Yeah, always. Yeah, that's a very always. good round of answer, to be fair. Yeah. Um, yes, it will be based on the comparable method up until it gets to a large enough scale whereby you can't convert it back and then you get the commercial Do, do you back. agree with Hayley on the numbers on that? Um, upwards of eight, upwards of eight. Uh, I would say. Um, seven, yes, can be. Again, depends on, on Well, where seven is sui generis. <clears throat> so yeah. you are in a different use classification. You are no longer, you know, in your residential kind of yeah, realm. Yeah, very so, much so. Every single seven bed I've yeah. ever had has been quite a lot of HMO, on a commercial basis. Quite a lot of HMO projects that I've seen have actually been houses that were probably these days oversized for the area. Perhaps the, you know the big Victorian mm -hmm. houses that are now well that would certainly be out of place as a eight or nine bedroom house, Victorian yeah. house. So yeah. so therefore you've probably got no downside to saying well it's going to be HMO and that's the way it's mm. going to stay. Well it comes down to demand as well doesn't mm. it you know and the value will very much look at that as well as you know and you should be looking at that as well mm. um, because ultimately we can turn any property into whatever we want but if there's no demand for that type of accommodation it's not worth the paper it's written on basically and mm. mm. um, so it comes down to good solid comparables good uh, you know good demand for that type of accommodation in the area are you making physical changes to the property to convert it into a HMO and how easy can it be converted back mm. to a home mm. and then whether it would be worth more or less will come down to the area itself yeah. okay all right well there we are that's all we've got time for in this half of the show so join me again after the break with Nicholas and Hayley with more of your answers you are watching Property TV. You are watching Property TV. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and with me are Nicholas Sopidis and Hayley Andrews. Welcome back, guys. So, Nicholas, your second question. I've been looking at purchasing an apartment in, cent in central London which has a relatively short time left on its lease, i.e. 57 years. I understand that on the new leasehold properties there is now a minimum term of 999 years. Will these new regula regulations apply retrospectively and therefore allow me to extend the lease time on this property without huge cost? Cool, that's a, that, yeah, I wonder one. what you're going to say on that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, let's start by addressing that the reforms haven't occurred yet. It was something put forward by the Housing Secretary last year. Okay. So whereby the uh, rights to extend up to 990 years and the removal of marriage value, which is probably the most significant in, in all of that, because I think Savills showed that anything upwards of 130 to 150 years is pretty much freehold value. Mm. So it doesn't necessarily assist you know, uh, the leaseholder in, in gaining more value in their property anyway. Um, so the Reform Act of 93 already gives leaseholders the right to extend to over 90 years. So they already have that right at this moment. It's a bit of window dressing, if I'm honest, and it hasn't been put in place. So to wait, you, there's no telling as to how long um, it will take. And I have seen some Kind of high-end lawyers contesting the removal of the marriage value because that has a significant um, impact on the freeholder. Mm. He takes up to 50% of the synergistic value of the property. Do you, sorry to interrupt you. So, do, you do you want to give our viewers a, a, a two-sentence benefit of the, of the meaning of the uh, expression marriage value? Yeah, I could do. Uh, so marriage value is essentially... Two sentences. The, no, it's <laughs> difficult to say in two. Um, it's the... The apportionment of value uh, to the freeholder after it drops below 80 years. Okay. So the lower it drops, so in this instance 57 years, the landlord have, will have a, a, a higher share of the, of the value, mm. which his apportionment is up to 50%. So uh, anything above 80 years, um, that wouldn't come into effect. So as it stands, the, the, the biggest change in this is the removal of marriage value which I think is the biggest game changer should that occur. Whether it does or not, I'm, I'm not sure yet, but it hasn't come into play. So whether to wait or not, the lower your lease gets, the more you're gonna pay. So 
I would actually advise is to get it done as quickly as you can okay. rather than waiting. <clears throat> So in terms in in terms of new build uh, developments, mm. um, are are developers just anticipating this regulation and giving nine nine nine? So years? as yeah, so what we've seen is uh, they already are uh, for new builds giving that and removing the uh, ground rent as well, taking it down to a peppercorn. To, or, yeah, peppercorn rent. So that's already happening. Albeit once you do extend your lease, even as it stands now, then it does reduce to a peppercorn anyway. Okay. I mean, I, th I think it's quite interesting where you get people coming into London who don't fully understand leasehold and freehold. Um, that they, they, they sort of think that um, sort of leasehold is some kind of dastardly trick that people in London sort yeah. of pull on you when you're buying a property. But actually, they shouldn't forget the real need for that. It, it, was, it was a way originally of just controlling the aesthetics of the building, the management of the building. And it's actually done properly. It works very, very well. Yeah, you know, if yeah. you've got a good landlord, if you've got a good managing agent, then it does it does work well. But like in most things in life, there are rogues and villains. Yeah, aren't there? I, I mean, I have seen, um, especially in older leases, where every 10, 20, 30 years the ground rent doubles. Doubles. Yeah. And I've seen recently, I don't know, uh, a lease extension for a client whereby it doubled to by the end of it, it was four thousand pounds a year, and he actually had an issue in obtaining a mortgage mm. to to acquire the property. So we had to extend the lease in order for him to to reduce that down to a peppercorn. So it does it does have an effect, but the majority of older leases, um, usually you'll be expected fifty pound, a hundred pound, two fifty, and it kind of doubles every twenty odd years. Um, Nick, I know when. when um uh, service charge was a subject a couple of years ago. There's a lot of people complaining about higher level of service charges, and one or two lenders were starting to say, when, when once the service charge goes above one percent of the value of the property, they were they've been mm. somewhat reticent to fund that property. Yeah. Are, you, are you finding that still? I I would I would say that uh, service charge is a big issue, bigger issue than your ground mm. rents and lease extensions mm. I agree because that, that could be significant. Yeah, you know, and that's an annual fee that you're paying. And are you finding many thousands. lenders do look at the service charge before they'll agree to lend? Yeah, 100%. Yes, yeah, because it, it can be quite hefty, and especially now what's going on with the, the fire regs and everything else, yes. and the removal of cladding. You can imagine it, it, it can be significant. Well, I can, yeah. I can only see that getting worse, especially if the government are determined to make the developer responsible, come what may, for the, for the mm. alterations to the building. Mm. I mean, I, I, I don't know where my sympathy lies, really, because, you know, a developer will have built a building. We all know building regs are fairly strict, in certainly in most town centres anyway. So they've complied with building regs, they've got their planning, they've done everything by the book, and then all of a sudden the government's saying, well, hey, it's your fault. You know, um, mm. you, you've got to pay. Um, conversely, is it right that the tenant who's who, who's paid their money in good faith and bought, exactly, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I don't know where the responsibility lies. Do you? No, I think it's uh, it's it's not great on both mm. sides, is it really? No. I mean, with a leasehold reform, I do think that that will be great news to anyone that is a leaseholder. And of course, I do think it will open up lending yeah. capability as well, because of course, short leases and things like that, you restricted. <laughs> um, so, and, and then of course, escalating ground rents and that is going yeah, to all yeah. be controlled. So from a leaseholder's point of view, it's fantastic news, really. Yeah, but I mean, from, a, from a freeholder, yeah, it's, it's not, not so, so great. Not so good. <laughs> I think Savills carry out some research and they actually found that if this reform does come into play, it will be more expensive to extend the lease. Not by much, but it will be slightly more expensive to extend the lease. Well, you see, I'm so, yeah, you know, it's look, meant to be fairer and easier and cheaper. But that's regulated, aim, isn't it? I mean, and I'm no it. leaseholder specialist, um, but mm. uh, and I I have a leasehold specialist <laughs> that I refer to if I have a leasehold issue, like mm -hmm. absent freeholder recently yeah. one I've just purchased, right. which has been a bloody nightmare. Just mm -hmm. part of my French, mm -hmm. but <laughs> it is meant to be easier and cheaper for. Oh, that, that's holders. the point. Yes, yeah, so it's isn't it? It's kind of capped, so, isn't it? Some there's a formula that yeah, you, you follow. See, of course, you, there you is see, a up formula. Until recently, the... Up until recently, uh, with all this talk of reform, you could probably get twenty-five, even thirty times the ground rent, couldn't you, for a mm. freehold investment? Mm. And that, that was very nice. I mean, the investment might might have been a little bit like watching paint dry, but nevertheless, it was safe. It was guaranteed because nobody wants to lose their property because they don't pay the ground rent, so the, it was secure. But of course, all that's out of the window now. So mm. now my fear is that they've that all been sold in auction. Well, yeah. <laughs> but my, my fear is that freeholders start to say, "Well, you know, let's have a look at the service charge and see how we can manipulate yeah. that to 
to you know it enhance the value yeah. of our freehold yeah. to you know because that's a very difficult argument in itself isn't it if a freeholder wants to instigate something on the service charge that he can show actually enhances the the, the value of the building mm. he's you've got a pretty tough struggle to stop him doing it yeah, yeah. At, at the moment i'm finding a lot of um, individuals are proceeding with leasehold enfranchisement so they've taken over the freehold mm. of the property but that's and all, they manage it themselves Nicholas, that's okay well. but I mean, if you take where i live i mean i think there's about 650 700 yeah. flats i would say 50 60 percent of them are owned abroad yeah. and you try you try and get your over 50 percent with, yeah. with that yeah lot. i think that yeah. works well on your smaller, <laughs> on the smaller kind box. of like yeah, four of six yeah. maybe yeah, yeah. Uh, I have been involved in some, some bigger ones, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot more difficult. Yeah. Is, um, would that be classed as a share of freehold? Uh, so, essentially, yes, you will have an apportionment of, yeah. um, and then you you will you will appoint a, you'll set up a company, and one person will be the director who manages the property management side of it. So, okay, yeah. well there we are. That was a great answer for you. Take it all in. Um, so there we are. Um, Hayley, your second question. If I buy a property with a view to turning it into either an HMO or a buy-to-let investment, given the fact that I rent now and, and don't own my main home, would the purchase of an investment property attract the 3% premium stamp duty tax as a second property? So if you're buying in your own personal name um, and you, you don't own a property, you wouldn't attract the 3% surcharge, but you would lose your first time buyer's relief. If you were to buy through a limited company, you would attract the 3% surcharge, but you would protect your own personal um, first time buyer's relief. So right. it, it's, you know, what, what's best for you, I really. You're, I mean, what you're trying to say is just stuff either way. Well, <laughs> well you're going to pay it one way or another. Um, so, of course, it, it depends on your structure and what you're looking to achieve. Are you looking to be a homeowner in the future? Um, you know, because, of course, that will have an impact on the stamp duty that you personally have to pay. So... Um, and of course, if you're paying, if you're buying, you know, commercial, again, it's completely different, and it doesn't apply. Mm. Um, so it's really, what are you buying? What's your intention? And what's going to be the best route for you, really? Um, so it's been a long time since I've purchased. Well, I, I don't. <laughs> it's never applied. You know, every single property I I've purchased from a residential point of view always fetches a three percent mm. surcharge. Mm. Um, because, you know, I've been buying well, for think, a long time. I think but... the moral here is a little bit like that business ethic, isn't it? That if, if, if somebody doesn't turn you over on the first deal, it's only because they're going to get you on the second one. <laughs> <laughs> it's I kind think, of a pinch think, before a bite yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the good one. No, I think uh, just work out. Of, I mean, majority of the people that are purchasing investment properties, their own home will be more valuable. So mm. the tax saving that they may have from there will probably be better for them. But again, it comes down to, you know, what, I mean, what do you, Hayley, you deal with a lot of people that are starting off in business. Do you, um, to me, it's 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 quite a, a new innovation where people rent their own home mm. but buy to invest. I mean, that's quite a new phenomenon, really, isn't it? Well, uh, I, it's more common recently, I would say. Um, the downside to that is, of course, um, your lending capability. You know, the lender wants to see that you're a homeowner. And uh, especially when you're just starting out, if you're investing through a brand new limited company, it holds no assets. You don't have, you know, kind of a credit profile or a footprint, no. especially if you're international as well. If you don't own your own home, you're limited to the lenders that are, yes. will actually, you know, put Well, you're going to end up having to give you. a sort of supported personal well, guarantee, aren't you, or something? And, and they want you to be a homeowner if mm. you're given a personal guarantee. Mm. Um, so a lot of them now are taking out personal guarantees and debentures mm. um, over the company. Um, but yeah, so you, your liability isn't limited, but from a tax point of view, it, it, you know, depending on what you're looking to achieve, it's pretty much most of the time the most tax efficient way to go down. But okay. And of course, if, you, if you're international, you're paying an extra 2% on top of the 3% surcharge yes. as well. Yes. So oh, it's terribly expensive, doesn't it? It's terribly expensive. <laughs> <laughs> How on earth we all make a living, I just don't know. <laughs> anyway, look, thank you both very much for coming in. Hayley Andrews, thank you for coming down you're all welcome. the way from thank Birmingham you. to see us. And uh, Nicholas Savides, thank you very much for coming in for your you. second show. Hope you enjoyed it. 
Thank you for watching. My name's Stephen Galpin. Join me again next time on Property Question Time.